The best advice I can give to a patient who's been diagnosed with mesothelioma is not to panic and to understand you've got hope. Mesothelioma I think I'm gonna start cutting carbs. I need to drop my belly fat. If you wanna drop this, Sherman and this is Stephanie Rasmussen and we're here to talk about stewardship. Now before everyone falls asleep let me ask Stephanie. Stephanie what do you think of when you think of stewardship? I usually think of financial gifts to the church. The pledge drive. Yes. Yeah that's what most people think. Uh, but you know stewardship is basically taking care of things in a responsible way and that financial gift is a very important part of that but as Methodists we commit to taking care of God's Word through our prayers, our presence, our service, our witness, and our gifts. Now we have a campaign, if you will, going on year-round called Stewardship in Action. And thank you for being our first guest to highlight prayer, because you have a very unique way of putting prayer into action for yourself. Can you tell us about that? Sure. So. As our church was going through this disaffiliation process last year, I felt a call to pray for our church every day. And I wanted to make sure that was something I didn't forget to do. So I set an alarm on my phone at a time that I know for my schedule is typically a convenient time to stop for a few moments and take a break. And so every day at a specific time, the alarm goes off on my phone and it says, pray for first grapevine. And so right now, I'm actively praying every day for our ongoing associate pastor search, which is something important that's happening in the life of our church. I'm also taking that time to pray for Pastor Grant and our other church staff, just that God will equip them for all that they need to do. And also praying for our church members and church leadership that God will guide us in what we need. As our church needs evolve, I'll probably change that daily prayer. Um, but it's become a very special spiritual discipline for me, and it's something I hope to continue for quite a long time. That is so, so cool. I mean, put, having a calendar an alarm is so simple, but really <laughs> inspiring. So did you put that on the survey on the E! News about prayer and action? I did. Okay, thank you very much. It's time for this week's episode of Some Good Grapevine News. Here's what's happening around our church. Are you or anyone that you know going through a period of grief? If so, we have a new Griefs Journey class that will be offered every Thursday from April 4th until May 9th. This class will meet in the Family Life Center in room 1013 from 6 p.m. until 7.30. That's every Thursday, 6 p.m. to 7.30, starting on April 4th. For more information, you can visit our website. Tuesday, April 16th, is also the day for our community meal. The dine-in option is from 6 to 7 p.m., with the drive through option being from about 6.15 till 7 p.m. Come for the community. Stay for the fellowship. To see this month's menu and more information, please visit firstgrapevine.org slash guests. Thursday Thursday is scheduled for, you guessed it, this coming Thursday, April 18th from 4.30 until 6. We'll be meeting in Harvest Hall. Please come by, have your beverage of choice, and join in the conversation. If you want more information, you can go to our website or check out our social media or give us a call. Be there. You won't want to miss it. 
Next Sunday on April 28th, we will welcome the newest members to our church. Our confirmation class will all be joining our church and affirming their own membership and their own faith journey on what we call Confirmation Sunday. That's going to take place in the 11 a.m. traditional service in the sanctuary. Please come and support these young people as they are embarking on their first time as adults, as individuals on their faith journey. Our youth group will be traveling to Group Dynamics next Sunday, April 21st, from 4 to 8 p.m. Please see our website for more details, but go and sign up. It's going to be an incredible time. It's not too late to sign up for our spring blood drive. It will be Sunday, April the 21st, in partnership with Carter Blood Care. This blood drive will be from 9.30 until 12.30 in the Family Life Center. By donating blood, you could save a life. For more details, please see firstgrapevine.org slash blood drive. From Main Street to Church Street will be a special event sponsored by our endowment fund. This event will be a conversation with Senior Pastor Grant Palma and Grapevine Mayor William D. Tate. This event will be on Thursday, May the 2nd, starting at 7 p.m. Dessert and coffee will be served. To see more details, please go to firstgrapevine.org slash from Main Street. Did you know that the Open Door Sunday School class is studying Adam Hamilton's book named Revival? If you would like to be a part of this Bible study, please come to room 1013 in the Family Life Center at 945 each Sunday. Have you ever wondered how science and logic support the Bible? If so, please join author Rodney Bond for a 12-week study every Tuesday from 6 to 7 p.m. in room 2001 starting April the 23rd through July the 9th. If you have any questions, please contact Mr. Bond. Do you want to support our troops by sending them special items? Support our troops will be collecting items from April the 14th until May the 5th. Then on May the 5th, they will be hosting a packing day at noon in the Family Life Center. To find out more of what is needed, please see firstgrapevine.org slash troops. It's not too early to start planning your summer. First off, we will be hosting a creative arts camp during the week of June the 3rd through the 6th. The areas that will be taught are culinary, art, crafts, and musical theater. For more information, please go to firstgrapevine.org slash creativeartscamp. Next up, we will be looking for some volunteers in the kitchen, at the sites, for lunch packing, and for the donation stations for Feed Our Kids for Big Week. We want to cover six different donation stations during the week of June the 24th through the 28th. If you'd like to volunteer or have any questions, please email Deb Shivey. The next big week we need you to put on your calendar will be Vacation Bible Camp, or VBC, which will be held July the 15th through the 18th. We need all hands on deck for this big program. These three big programs we will be hosting this summer need as much help as we can get. Please go to firstgrapevine.org for more details. Here are a few people that are celebrating birthdays this week. If you're celebrating something, we hope that celebration is a great one. Until we meet again, here's to you having some great news this week. Welcome to First Grapevine. Please let us know that you are here worshiping with us so that you can experience and share God's love along with us. If you would let us know you are here by registering on the card in front of you, on our mobile app, or on the church website, firstgrapevine.org. here at First Great Mind Methodist. And um, there are several things that I'm super excited about this morning. If you don't know, and that's totally fine if you don't, I'm Josh and this is the band and we like to sing music so that we can all stand up and praise God together. But uh, before we do that, I wanna let you know, we've got Justin, uh, excuse me, Todd back here on drums this morning and he's jumping in at the last minute when Greg was called away to work. So thank you, Todd. 
Quinn will be over here singing with us this morning. I know we all love that. And, uh, and, and Pastor Sam's going to come give us a message today, uh, just here in a little while. So we've got a lot of new things. And let me just tell you something. There's no better way to be ready to appreciate the Holy Spirit than enjoy some new things at church. So if you're the kind of person that has a hard time when we do things a little different or I make adjustments to your church service, this is a growth opportunity for you, okay? Why don't y'all stand up and sing with us? Here we go.
like once again to welcome you all to church here. And uh, we've got a, a way for you to tell us that we really like when you do that. There's an app that you can use. There's a website you can go to. Or there's a little piece of paper in the back of the chair in front of you that you can fill out. And what we'd like for you to do is to let us know that you were here and let us know if there's anything we can do as a church for you. Dan is going to lead us through this next song, talking about how God will not let us go, just like the first one we just sang. That we can trust if we build our life on God, God will never abandon us. And that's what we can be for each other as a body of Christ. So before we start singing, I want you to look around, see who's here, wave at people, shake their hands, hug them, whatever you need to do, but make sure no one leaves this building without being noticed and seen to them. Christ is my firm foundation. The rock on which I stand when everything Oh, 
discipline of giving money to the church to use to build God's kingdom. It's something that we talk about um, that it's important to do for each one of us to remember to return the gifts that God gives us. But sometimes that can feel awkward to do it so uh, visibly or publicly. So what we've decided to do is put a box at the back of the room here that you can go and make your private unseen contribution whenever you would like to during this service during the week whatever we're still going to sing a reflective spiritual song one that invokes the Holy Spirit to come be with us in this place to move our hearts to heal our hurt so as we sing this song together be contemplative
part where Lucy's going to come up to the front and all the kids are going to come with her and she's pointing at me, which means I've gotten something wrong. So. Join me in a moment of silent prayer as we lift up Pastor Grant to the Lord and ask for his quick healing and quick return to us. Amen. Okay, now the kids can come down for children's time. Hey guys. Okay. Here we can scoot down. <laughs> if y'all want, you can sit over here if you want to record it. Okay. So <laughs> today, Pastor Sam is going to be talking about fear. Have you guys ever been scared of something? Anything? Anyone want to share? Is it too scary to share? <laughs> Go ahead. The dark. The dark, yeah. Anyone else? It's okay. You definitely don't have to share. Things can be scary, and sometimes I get scared about talking in front of the church or praying in front of people, but when I have this fear, I like to think about my favorite Bible verse, 2 Timothy 1.7. For God has not given me a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and self-control. Sometimes fear can get the best of us, but we should remember that God didn't give us a spirit of fear, and God is always there for us, and we can lean on him when we get scared or we're sad. Now, that doesn't mean that we'll never be scared of anything ever again. I'll, I'll, we'll still get nervous, but I know that with God, I can handle anything. Will you guys pray with me? Okay, repeat after me. Dear God, help us remember that you are with us no matter what. Even if things are scary, we know we can lean on you. Thank you for always loving us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Lucy. Uh, well, good morning, y'all. My name is uh, my name is Sam. I am uh, getting to hang out with y'all this morning, which is fun. Uh, I'm one of the pastors at White's Chapel Methodist Church in South Lake. Uh, I do our Saturday night service. Um, I know several of you, and I've gotten to preach here once before, 
Um, but uh, I was uh, happy to, 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 to step up and, and, and get to hang out with y'all again this morning. Um, for a little bit of context, we're, we're doing a series at, at my church right now called Undefeated. Uh, we started it last week, and, and the, the premise is pretty straightforward. Right now we're talking about what are the things that Christ defeated on Easter? Because we use that kind of language all the time. Jesus defeated death and sin and darkness and evil and all of these things. Uh, but we're trying to really dig into that because uh, if you're not aware, we are now in the season of Eastertide. And this is my favorite liturgical season of the year, which I recognize is like a nerdy pastor thing to say, to have a favorite liturgical season. But Eastertide is my favorite uh, because it's in this season that we keep on celebrating what we started just a couple of weeks ago. On Easter, we gathered together in our churches and we wore pastel colors and uh, and we, we worshipped and took pictures and maybe you ate some of your children's Easter candy. Uh, I definitely did. Uh, but she's 16 months old, so she can't eat it anyway. Um, but it was wonderful. It's great. We had a good time. But we shouldn't let the celebration end there. Because we aren't an Easter people one day a year. We're not an Easter people for a couple of hours early in the spring every year. We're an Easter people Every day, every year. And so in that spirit, uh, we're, we're talking about the things that Easter accomplishes. The things that Christ defeated through his life, his death, and his resurrection. And so last week at my church, I talked about the big one. Death. How through his resurrection, Jesus conquers death itself. But today we're going to be talking about something that's a little more common. Something that, that all of us face on a very regular basis, and it's exactly what Lucy talked about. It's fear. Fear is, is something the Bible talks about all the time. In fact, I've heard it said that there are 365 instances in the Bible where uh, Scripture says either do not be afraid or fear not. 365, one for every day of the year. Uh, now, I don't know if that's an exact real number or if that's just like preacher number, because that exists, but... Uh, and I didn't have time to go count this week because, like I said, I have a toddler at home. But what I do know is that the Bible uses those phrases, fear not or do not be afraid, constantly. The point is, Scripture is always reminding us to be wary of fear. And we're going to see one example of that in our text for today. Our Scripture is going to come from 1 John. Now, I want to give us a little bit of context uh, before we jump in, uh, there isn't really a scholarly consensus on who wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. We know it was someone named John, but we don't know if it was John the Apostle or, or, or John uh, of Patmos. Um, we just know it was someone named John. What we do know, however, is who the audience of 1st John was. Uh, this letter, this first epistle, is written to the church in Ephesus at a time when the church was struggling. They were afraid. They were fearful for their future because this church had lost lots and lots of people to false teachers who'd come in and were spewing bad doctrine, which is what much of this, this letter is about. Basically, there was a group that had been preaching an early form of Gnosticism. Uh, and don't worry, I'm not going to be the guest preacher who comes in and spends 40 minutes talking about Gnosticism. But what you need to know is essentially uh, Gnosticism was an ancient heresy that said you needed to have this like special, secretive knowledge in order to know God and be saved. And so that's what these people were saying. And, and of course, it was scaring some of the people left in this church. They were fearful. They were wondering, okay, do I have the special knowledge? Do I know the secret? Do I really know God? Am I really saved? They had been told over and over that they were living wrong. And so they were wondering... What are the things we should be doing? What are the ways that we should be living? What should be guiding our lives? They were confused and they were afraid. And so the author of this letter uh, writes to them uh, and, he, and he shares words of encouragement and guidance. And so if you've got your Bibles, of course you can pull those out. I'm, I think we'll have it up here on the screen as well. Uh, this is 1 John chapter 4, verses 16 through 18. And this is what it says. So we have known and believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. 
Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness on the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. Okay, so the author of John tells the church in Ephesus not to be guided by fear, but to be led by love. He says there is no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear. In essence, he's telling them that they have to decide what kind of people they're going to be, what they're going to let lead their lives. And he's warning them not to choose fear. Because as we all know and as we've all experienced, fear has its consequences. This is something we know and it's something we need to remember and be aware of. That if we let fear dictate our lives, if we let worry consume us, we'll end up in the same place as the church in Ephesus. We'll end up stuck. See, fear was impacting the early church in the same way it impacts many of us. It slows us down. It holds us up. Fear freezes us. Fear has a tendency to stop us from moving forward. And and I think that's what had happened to the church in Ephesus. They were frozen. They were stuck. They had all these people who had left the church and and run off with these Gnostic teachers. And they were beginning to wonder if they were going to survive as a church. If they had missed out on the truth. And because of that, this church wasn't functioning the way it was supposed to. Fear had frozen them. And you know what? I think it does the same thing to us. There's a great story I read uh, in a book recently by Simon Sinek. If you know Simon, he's he's sort of a a bigwig in like corporate leadership circles. Uh, But he has a book called The Infinite Game. And really, it's a corporate leadership book, but... One of the stories he tells in the 10th chapter is about Kodak. Kodak, like the, the photography company. Kodak was initially founded uh, by George Eastman. He, he was the man who brought photography to the masses. He made capturing moments of our lives accessible in a way that had never been done before. And so from its inception, Kodak was this really successful business. And the company thrived for decades even after George Eastman passed away in the 1930s, uh, Kodak was, was doing really, really well because they were known to be an extremely innovative company. In fact, at one time, it was one of the largest corporations in the world, and they employed more than 150,000 people. Well, in 1975, fast forward a little bit, 1975, this engineer named Steve Sasson, who worked for Kodak, invented the first digital camera. And this was revolutionary. This was going to change everything. Photography was never going to be the same. And unfortunately, that's when fear creeped in. See, the executives at Kodak were terrified that this new technology was going to cause problems for them. They knew that it was going to make their current business, uh, business model obsolete. Because at the time, they made pretty much all of their revenue off of film and off of cameras that required film to operate. But this new digital camera rendered both of those things completely unnecessary. And so these executives at Kodak, they were afraid. And so they decided to bury this, to hide this invention. They sat on it for almost 15 years. They let fear guide them. They let fear freeze them in place. And you know what? That was okay for a while. But eventually, it caught up to them. Eventually, other people made this discovery too. And in 1990, the Logitech photo man, which you can look that up on your, 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 your phone later, uh, the first camera looks like a toaster, to be honest. But the Logitech photo man came out in 1990, uh, became the first publicly available digital camera. And then a few years later, there was a a company out of Japan that you've probably heard of before called Nikon that released the Nikon D1. And by the time Kodak got around to releasing this thing that they had initially invented in the 1970s, it was just too late. They'd been frozen for too long. 
In 2012, Kodak filed for bankruptcy. And this company that once employed 150,000 people, I looked it up a couple of days ago, they used to employ 150,000. Today, they employ 4,100. See, fear can freeze us. It can cause us not to act. And if we choose to live our lives guided by fear, then what happened to Kodak can happen to us. We can miss out on amazing things. That's one of the great dangers of fear. I mean, imagine that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had, had let fear lead them. Imagine they hadn't had the courage to walk into that furnace. They wouldn't have got to experience God showing up and performing a miracle. Or imagine if Moses was too afraid, which he almost was, but imagine if Moses was too afraid to go where God was calling him. Thousands of people would have remained in bondage and slavery in Egypt. Imagine if all of the people that Jesus heals in the Gospels were too afraid to speak and ask him for help. Over and over again in the Gospels, we see them say, Son of David, have mercy on me. Help me. Heal me. But imagine they didn't. They wouldn't have gotten to experience his healing and his grace and his mercy firsthand. Look, I could go on and on with examples from Scripture, but the point is, if we let fear lead our lives, then we're not going to go anywhere. We're going to stay in the same place, and we're going to miss out on what God wants to do in and through us. And I think that that's a part of what John is trying to warn the church in Ephesus about. He doesn't want them to get stuck in the losses that they'd experienced to, to, to all of these false teachers. He doesn't want them to live their lives. He doesn't want the church to operate out of a place of fear. He wants them to get back to what matters, to get back to mission and ministry and making disciples. He doesn't want them to be guided by fear. He wants them to be guided by love. And that's what this entire chapter of 1 John is all about, if you've ever read it. It's all about love. And John writes about this as a way to reset this church to remind them that first and foremost, they ought to love. He's telling him, you, you don't need all the things that these false teachers are telling you you need. You don't need some special secretive knowledge. You just need to love God and to love each other. He says, if you do that, if that guides you, if that's your priority, then the fear that you're wrestling with, the fear you're experiencing, it'll dissipate. Because there is no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear. See, fear is one of the things that got defeated on Easter. All of the scariest things that this life has to throw at us, death and sin and darkness and brokenness, loneliness, separation from God, it all got defeated when Christ gave his life and rose from that grave. That is the unfathomably good news that we keep on celebrating during Eastertide. That we don't have to be afraid. That we don't have to spend our lives frozen because Jesus has already defeated those things. And he did it because he loves us. He did it because he loves you. Fear's greatest enemy is love. Because love is what defeated fear on that cross. And look, that doesn't mean that we're, gonna, we're not going to have moments when, when we struggle with fear. Of course we will. The next time that I have to get on an airplane, I will know that firsthand. I hate flying. Uh, but here's what it does mean. It doesn't mean we're not going to have fear, but it does mean that we have a way to address the fears in our lives. And it's exactly what our scripture says. It's love. See, fear freezes us, but love frees us. And yes, I know that that is some cheesy preacher wordplay, but it's true. Love frees us. It frees us up to go out in ministry and mission to a world that, that needs the good news we're celebrating right now. It frees us up to go where God calls, to get on the move, to be the church. 
That's why John so desperately wanted the church in Ephesus to be guided not by fear, but by love. Because he had been there. He, he knew they had work to do. They had lives to impact. They had people to reach. They had mouths to feed. They had souls to care for. And if they stayed stuck in their fear over the things that these false teachers had said, if they stayed frozen, they would miss out on all of the amazing things that God was preparing for them. And you know what? The same is true for us. We cannot afford to let fear lead. We can't let fear be the lens through which we see God and the world. We need to see the world. We need to see our God through the lens of love. Because when we do that love, it casts out our fear. And it gets us going. And it sends us out to go and do the things God is calling us to. Uh, I love the story of, of Gary Haugen. He's the founder of International Justice Mission. If, if you don't, uh, also knows IJM. If you don't know about IJM, it's a Christian organization, the largest in, uh, in the world, that fights human trafficking all across uh, the, the world. And when I was growing up, it was kind of a dream of mine to work for IJM one day, and so I actually did pre-law in college. You can see my degree's not doing me a whole lot of good these days. God had other plans, I guess, but uh, anyway... Gary Haugen was, uh, earlier in his life, was a very successful lawyer with the United States Justice Department. He graduated top of his class at Harvard Law. He, he was well-revered in his career and succeeding uh, mightily, and uh, things were going great for him. Uh, and then God, as God does, placed something on his heart that would go on to become this organization, IJM. And I just want to read you an excerpt uh, that Gary wrote about the formation of IJM and how it almost didn't happen. Uh, this is what Gary writes. He says, I vividly remember when I finally had to make a decision to abandon my career at the U.S. Department of Justice to become the first employee of a not-for-profit organization that didn't yet actually exist called International Justice Mission. I had worked for three years with friends on the idea of IJM, and I was very excited, in theory, about this dream of following Jesus in the work of justice in our world. But then I had to actually act. I had to walk into the Department of Justice and turn in my badge. I tried to be very brave, but also very safe. That is to say, I walked in and asked my bosses for a year-long leave of absence. My bosses politely declined. I was suddenly feeling very nervous. What was I really afraid of? As I thought about it, I feared humiliation. If my little justice ministry idea didn't work, no one was going to die. If IJM turned out to be a bad idea and collapsed, my kids weren't going to starve. We'd probably just have to live with my parents for a while until I could find another job, but with my education, odds are I soon would find one. The fact is, I would be terribly embarrassed. Having told everybody about my great idea, they would know that it was either a bad idea or worse, that I was a bad leader. Either way, it would be humiliating. So there it was, my boundary of fear. I sensed God inviting me to an extraordinary adventure of service, but deep inside, I was afraid of looking like a fool and a loser. And that was actually very helpful to see because it helped me get past it. I thought, when I'm older, do I really want to look back and say, yeah, I sensed that God was calling me to lead a movement to bring rescue to people who desperately need an advocate in the world, but I was too afraid of getting embarrassed, and so I decided to never even try. Okay, I love that story, and I love his words, because Gary almost let fear win. He almost chose to stay comfortable because forming IJM was too scary. But he didn't. He chose to act, and he did it because of love. It was love that freed him to take the leap and to try and make this organization succeed. And thank goodness... He let love lead. Thank goodness he didn't let fear freeze him in place. Because every year IJM helps free thousands of people from slavery. I looked up the statistics this week uh, just from 2023. And in 2023, IJM helped free 10,372 victims uh, of violence, oppression, and human trafficking. And it also helped convict uh, over 1,400 people who were involved in human trafficking. All of that amazing work. And fear almost won. But it didn't. Gary chose to be led 
by love, to be led by a love for God and a love for, for those in this world who, as he says, desperately needed an advocate. It was love that freed him to overcome his fear of embarrassment. That perfect love that he felt, it cast out fear. And it sent him out on mission. And I genuinely believe it will do the same thing for us if we let it. See, God doesn't want us frozen in place. He doesn't want us to live our lives afraid, fearful of of sin and death and brokenness. And so he defeated all of those things. He became one of us and he felt everything that we feel. And he gave his life for us and he conquered the grave for us. And because of that, we don't have to be afraid anymore. The scariest things that this life can throw at us aren't that scary. Because Jesus has made a way for us to be with him always. And that is the best news in human history. Look, we can be a people who choose to let fear lead our lives. We can choose the way of Kodak, and we can be stuck. Or we can let love lead our lives. We can choose the path of Gary Haugen, the path that the author of 1 John is calling us to. We can let fear freeze us, or we can let love free us. The choice is ours. Hallelujah. Amen. Will you pray with me? Lord, we thank you. We thank you that you are a God that is always with us, that walks with us through the valley of the shadow of death. Lord, we confess that there have been many times when we have let fear lead. There have been many times when we either did something or didn't do something because we were too scared. But Lord, my prayer for us this morning, my prayer for every single person in this room, is that we would invite in your perfect love that we would be a people who choose to let your love, that, that love that you exemplified for us on the cross, that we would let it lead our lives, that we would let it get us going. Lord, we don't want to be frozen anymore. We don't want to be stuck. We want to get on the move. We want to go out in mission and ministry to a world that desperately needs it. Jesus, we love you and we thank you. We pray all of this in your name. Amen. Thank you, Steve. Amen. So think about what we just heard. We think about what we have to do after this. We're going to sing this last song together. Waymaker. As we sing these words, meditate on what they really mean. Meditate on what you've heard and all say God is the way. And Jesus is what we have to follow. And the Spirit is how we connect those two things into action. times of questions we have to remember that God has the answers God is our word maker just stand and sing with me you are here moving in our midst I worship you I worship you you are
Christ and go faithfully into the world that God has called you to serve. Know that it doesn't stop here. God doesn't stop working on us here.